Hello, fellow travelers, and welcome to another episode of the Traverse Stars podcast, third season. How are my loyal listeners? Please support the show by liking and subscribing. This is an amazing episode called Talia Tran Boards the Mothership, discuss Avatar The Last Airbender. Now come aboard as we go traversing the stars. Hi, Miss Tran. Thank you so much for the Traverse Stars podcast. Hi, pleasure to be here. It's totally my pleasure as well. So I always start off with a question of inspiration. So inspired your love for acting, who are your earliest influences? Oh, that's a good one. Um, for acting, actually, I started out in music. So I started out with singing, playing instruments. And my vocal coach recommended me to an acting coach. And it was like love at first sight. And ever since then, I've really been just devoted to creation in all in all forms. And inspirations, I would say, well, my sister is definitely one of my biggest inspirations just overall in life and she inspires me to work hard to be positive and to just embrace all the joys and even the challenges of life and creatively i would say like the people that i work with like Mm -hmm. i've been very fortunate to have been on projects with really wonderful casts and every single person i work with i feel like i learn so much from them whether that be their process whether that be their headspace how they interact with others I've just worked with really generous actors and I strive to be like them. So, yeah. So are you still doing, um, doing music as well as acting or are you focus oh, on sure, yeah. what, what kind of music? Uh, I like to write music. I am classically trained in piano and, you know, I took guitar lessons and stuff like that. But wow. I would say that my primary musical influences when it comes to writing music are pop and R&B. Uh, some... I wouldn't say I, I don't write rock music, but I would I definitely would say that some of my dad's music has influenced my music listening taste. Yeah. And maybe that'll show up at some point. But yeah. That's so cool. So um so you know how to to write music um as like a composer would, you're able to write music like that? Oh yeah, yeah. You know, to be honest with you, most of the time I don't actually you know, when I first started out writing music, I would write note for note on just a bunch of sheet music. Like yeah. and I, I think that my process over time has just become a lot more uh fluid and, and loose with it. I don't really write individual notes. I I record them for my own reference so that in the future I can look back at it and, and listen and take what I like and leave what I don't like and and I I do write the music and the lyrics and everything and and yeah I think it's something that has always been a little bit just intuitive I guess yeah. So from a, from a creative standpoint, um, I I always have a a standing philosophy and and I might be wrong so you can you can tell me if I'm wrong that understanding one sort of creative process helps you understand other forms of creative creative things better. So in other words, I agree, oh, yeah. go ahead. Right. Oh no! Yeah, I was gonna say that's that's a really great great point, and I think that's why artists uh, thrive in other forms of art, even if that's not where they started out. You know, I know so many dancers who went into singing or into acting, or actors who went into singing dancing. Like, I think they all just feed into each other so well because really creativity is so much like a muscle. You hmm. you use it, and you 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 become better as you practice it more, and. I think that your creative background really influences how you approach the creative process in other forms of art, which I find really interesting because you'll see a dancer approach acting very differently than a singer approaching acting. And I think they're both really wonderful mm-hmm. and they're just vastly different and neither is wrong and they're both great. So since you mentioned how a singer approaches acting and, and being a singer and a, um, a musical performer as well, how does your ability to not only sing and work with your voice and the other aspects of singing help you become a better actor? I would say that, you know, when I've worked with dancers and people who come from a very physical background, I I kind of talked to them about their process because I was really intrigued about it. And I know this is not true of all dancers, but I noticed a lot of them come from an external, uh, they start their external work and they work towards the inside okay. and I I tend to work out more I work on emotions and creating like the emotional world inside of me and I think that just comes from 
you know, my background in music and when I'm writing a song, I kind of have a world of emotion that I'm in and I try to find words to to kind of fit into that world and kind of bring that word a world and spread it outwards. Yeah. And I think that that has carried over into my acting process and I like to experiment with different stuff as well because it's it really is not a fixed process and I think that it's always good to be experimenting with different things. Now, now, now someone who as I said as also is a writer so you, you basically are covering all the great arts music <laughs> writing acting or you're covering all of them. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> so, as someone who is a, is a skilled writer as well how does that affect you looking at a script where a non-writer may look at a script in one way? How does someone who understands the writing process and even writing from a musical standpoint as well, which to me yeah. as well, um, classical music is also a form of writing. It's just without words, it's music. Yeah. So how does that help you understand a script better? How does that under help you understand how to explore a character within a script as well? Yeah, yeah. I think that coming from a musical background has really helped me understand the beats of a script, you know, breaking down into dynamics you know we go into so much into dynamics when it comes to especially classical music it's just such a big part of that and i think that sometimes when you approach acting and you, you forget about all of that and you're like wait no this is actually something really important they don't write dynamics into the script a lot of times but they're there you have to feel them you, you read through a script and you break it down into like the, it's different parts and and you want to give it that those dynamics because just in the same way that it makes music that engaging because you can go on a journey with it acting is, is so similar and you want to give it that ebb, those ebbs and flows and that's what makes a really natural feeling scene and uh yeah so um it's kind of a cool thing um last week i got to interview the composer for avatar the last airbender so it no was very cool so it was a pleasure yeah. so as someone um when you're understanding composing a, um, a piece and you're thinking of the themes of the musical themes as well. When you're looking at a script, how are you finding the the theme of your character to understand where to start and figure out who they are? I think it really depends from character to character. And I think especially with the world of auditions these days, you know, they don't even give you a whole script most of the time. You just get sides and and a lot of times even the character breakdowns are sparse and you don't get a whole lot of that. And so I think a lot of it falls upon the actor hmm. to kind of take creative liberties. <laughs> I'm not sure if that's what casting directors are looking for. That's what I do. I take a few <laughs> creative liberties here and there. And I think it's really about seeing what I try like looking at the, the the flow of the sides and trying to see the tone sense the tone you can't always do it properly but if you can try to at least sense the tone and sometimes you can also gauge that by the by the people who are involved in the genre of the the project and i think that that is kind of where i start sometimes so that I can know, like, you don't want to be <laughs> like being really big and and theatrical in a project that's really small and subtle, and hmm. and so it, it's it's a it's a guessing game a lot of times. To be quite honest with you, so I mean, that's just crazy. I mean, like I said, luckily I, I never had to audition because I'm, I'm not an actor, and I, I there's <laughs> many reasons why that's a good thing that I'm not an actor. <laughs> <laughs> oh, then I'll be bad at it. Um, when 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 you, when when you're auditioning, then is it a question of are you good at acting or are you or the part or is it did you figure out what the director wanted you to do in that particular scene that you only kind of saw half a page to that is that see that is a really interesting part because you know i've had discussions with many acting coaches as well as actors and everybody has a sort of different philosophy on it and really everybody pretty much agrees that acting technique in and of itself is a completely different thing. You can be a wonderful actor. You can have the, the best character work and you can really bring characters to life and your audition can suck because <laughs> it, it just, there's so much that gets lost in translation because it's such a small part of it and you're not interacting with the other actors. And hmm. like, I have like a blue screen behind me. Like, you're not immersed in the world. It's, it's just very, very different and I think when it comes to choosing actors, I, I obviously can't speak from the standpoint of a a casting director, but I think they try to pick actors who can kind of bring something unique to the role. Um, because I, at least from what I've heard, you know, a lot of actors, when they get sides, they're like, oh, this is an intuitive choice. And everybody's making the same intuitive 
choice and nobody really stands out anymore and i think that's especially obvious with self tapes because you play them back to back to back and everybody is just sounding the exact same so i feel that i found a lot more freedom and instead of trying to guess what every director wants on every single line to just really focus on creating a character that i believe would contribute to the work the meaning of the work and and I, I want to give to the other characters because I, I don't want to just be like, oh, I'm having my own little star moment over here. Like, <laughs> I want to be a character who gives to other characters, gives other people something to work with. And just coming from that creative point of view, I think has been a lot more fulfilling for me because, yeah, you do go through a million auditions. And to really get somewhere in this industry, especially with self-tapes these days, you have to, it's really important to find a way to enjoy the process. And, and that's what I enjoy about it, just finding something to just to focus on the work and do something that I'm proud of, something that is fun for me, mm. something that I, I believe would contribute to it. Yeah. So um, um, for the listeners, uh, you play, is it May or Mai for about- May. Uh, May, oh, you get to pronounce May. I'm really bad with names. Anyone who watches the show knows You that. are totally fine. <laughs> thank, you, thank you. So for uh, May, for Avatar The Last Airbender, do you remember what that audition was like? And how did you yeah. kind of twist on it? It was an interesting one because they didn't tell us what it was again these auditions they, they don't tell you and this one was especially secretive because of the nature of the project and they they had a code name for it what was the code, code name? names for the characters they didn't tell you the real plot they had a fake plot <laughs> so really it was such a guessing game and just looking back on it I'm so grateful and astounded that I have booked the role. And I, I really am just just so incredibly grateful to the creative team for trusting me with that. Even though at first I had no idea what I was doing. I was like, okay, deadpan, what can I do with deadpan? That was basically what they had given me, deadpan, fake name, fake project, fake plot. <laughs> oh, so I, I think you can reveal it. What was the code name and what was the character's code name? Do you remember? Yes, so it was under Blue Dawn at the time. Blue Dawn. <laughs> very different from avatar the last airbender uh, and my character's name may was molly molly yeah very just, <laughs> <laughs> it was a, it just a very generic name and i was like okay i don't really know what to do with this you, you know you get a couple pages of sides and no script and you're just like uh well okay i'll just try to bring what i can to my character and i i think if they had told us what the project was, I wonder what the how the audition process would have been different because I know when it comes to adapting cartoons or other sources of uh, source material that aren't live action and adapting them into live action, you know, it, it a balance of of imitating the original character while still bringing fresh freshness mm -hmm. to it. And I think that a lot of actors would probably be in their heads about it, including myself. and. So I don't know, maybe it would have been different had I known what the project was. Well, it's kind of funny because um, I'm spending probably too much time online, which apparently is a thing. Um, you know, and listening to people talk about avatars, there's some there was some conversation of whether or not, you know, because it's a cartoon, should the characters be cartoony? Like, where's the line between cartoony and live action? Yeah. Like, 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 where do you walk the line between honoring this very kind of, a, some sometimes very cartoonish cartoon, because it's a cartoon, yeah. but also the live action is its own, thing and it yeah. is it has its own seriousness to it. it has its own type of rules of what you should do with on a live action so where did you decide to find that line which is i'm going to play it this way yeah either veer off from the cartoon or dive into it so i think that you know the showrunner albert did a wonderful job of ad adapting this into live action because when you do go into live action it takes on a different tone and he really leaned into that he went with a darker more serious tone and i think that's definitely suitable for a live action compared to a cartoon because we're not going to be flying around and changing shapes and doing all that fun stuff that cartoons can do okay. <laughs> um and for me personally you know i had been a fan of the show growing up and re-watching the show several times i i knew that i wanted to try to vocally lean into what cricket the original voice actress of may she did a stellar job and i cannot praise her enough she did such a wonderful job of bringing such a uniqueness to the to the voice of the character and i wanted to kind of you know obviously i don't have her same voice but i wanted to lean into that to the placement of her voice and i think as a singer that was also really interesting for me to do and um, and I'll you, what do you mean by placement of the voice 
Oh, so when I speak like a little bit lower and it's like a little bit breathier and like a little more rasp, so it's a little bit more throaty, if that makes sense. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, yeah. it's interesting because I think when I'm in different spaces, I'll speak very differently and I'm more aware of that just because my singing background, I'm like, oh, I'm speaking very much nasally right now or very much in my mouth, my throat. And so it's 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 interesting to to sort of think about. And I think most of the actors on Avatar did do a lot of put a lot of thought into that because really what we had of these people were their voices. And we want to honor that. But obviously we <laughs> we can't imitate it exactly and we're not gonna say line for line the exact way that people did it because it just would feel a little, little bit robotic and and so for bringing new life into it, I think we wanted to really ground the character yeah. instead of being more of a caricature ish type thing. We wanted to really delve into the relationships that our characters had with the other characters and really give them a reason to be the way they are. Because in cartoons, cartoons are a little bit more forgiving in terms of letting a character be a little bit more of a, an archetype. Mm. and. I think it's also with the nature of being a, a, a kid's show and there's limited time and you can't delve into all the relationships. And I think Albert really wanted to uh, delve into that. Although Avatar, I have to say, did a really wonderful job of bringing depth into a kid's show. And it was really an unprecedented amount of of meaning and that went into the original work. And, and, I, and I think, I don't know if everyone appreciates that, what you can do it with a cartoon character and make it work in a cartoon it would look really silly if you did it in live action. Yeah. And like yeah. a, a real person behaving that way with their mannerisms probably yeah. would not translate well. And I think some people uh, have trouble recognizing that they're like, oh, they didn't do this exact thing. Mm-hmm. Well, some things are not <laughs> going to translate super well. And I think Albert has a really good understanding of that. And it's, it's something that we have to be like, is this going to translate well or are we going to look extremely goofy doing this as a, <laughs> as a human person? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so you had your audition. What happened? So when you found out what it was for, that you're going to yeah. be now in Avatar, you're playing May. What was that experience like? What was it like when you actually got onto the sets and you saw, cause those things, yeah. it's all the CGI, but still. They, they look yeah. Impressive. It, 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 we had some really impressive sets Um, for, the audition when I found out it was Avatar Last Airbender, honestly, I was I was just a little bit like like I didn't even have words for it. I was just shocked. I'm like, I'm auditioning for this. First of all, I didn't know they were making live action adaptation of this. I guess I was not caught up on the news. But <laughs> yeah, I was like, really? I'm going me? This? Like I was I was super shocked and when I booked it as well, I was I wasn't sure, like, are you sure? Like, are you playing a joke? What, what is this? What, what's happening? And I think just that has also been my feeling kind of just <laughs> for the past several years, I've just been in shock because really, how many people get the chance of a lifetime to do something like this? It really is a, like a role of a lifetime. It's an absolute dream. And being on sets, we got to work on the volume and and we got to actually see our backgrounds behind us which was really cool i know they did do some green screen work as well but this was i i had never been on anything like this before and you get to see just the amount of detail that goes into the the backgrounds and you really get to be immersed into the environments and and me and the other girls who play azula and Ty Lee, we uh snuck around on the sets a little bit took some peeks at and then building the sets, hiding behind things are like, oh my God, do you see that over there? Uh, and that was just so fun. It was a great bonding moment for us as well. And getting to really see everything just come to life, like right in front of you. It's it's really incredible. Now, unlike some series that are out there, and I'm, I'm only speculating here. Unlike some series that are out there on Netflix, a bunch of stuff, there's that real possibility that you're one season and done. But with Avatar... You have a pretty good feeling it's gonna go more seasons. Not only because the cartoon did, but because it's also, huh? I hope so. I was gonna say. I, was gonna say, uh, I thought you said you said you knew already that it was going. No, 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 no. But, I don't know. If somebody knows out there, please let me know. But <laughs> I, I really do hope so because you know, everybody just has so much love for this. Uh, everybody who's working on this really just 
so much love and passion went into this and you know there's so much more exciting stuff to do especially you know because my character and Ty Lee we weren't originally in book one and we got to kind of sneak in our way into season one we're like hey we'll just pop by real quick and we really have so much more fun stuff that we get to do in books two and three so I'm really hoping we get to do that I want to go chase people I want to throw knives at people well, <laughs> that's about to ask you because I mean, I'm just putting it out in the world and making it a thing that Avatar is going to have seasons two, three, and four because it's going to happen because it's Avatar. And obviously, as anyone who's watched the Avatar, we know May has um, a lot more going on in these other seasons. Um, it, things with, um, you know, a, a lot of the characters um, with, and you get to some fight scenes. Knowing that this is probably potentially out there, like hanging out there, um, did that impact how you approach the character knowing later you're going to build into what you know probably this yeah so i think we wanted to with our appearance in the first season and people you know i'm sure there are many people who are wondering like why are they in the first season <laughs> well the reason why we're in the first season is because we wanted to kind of set a foundation for the relationships between the girls this uh trio this iconic trio and we wanted to kind of get them in in their home territory and just see how they interact with each other because when they go off onto their adventures, we're going to see a little bit more of that interaction and not to spoil too much, but there's some interesting stuff that goes on between the, the three girls later on into the seasons. I yep. believe you guys have watched it, but <laughs> yes. Um, so getting to see that journey. And I think that that foundation, the start of the journey is a really important part to, so that we get a good foundation for that. And, really into books two and three. We have so much fun, fun, fun stuff. I am praying so hard. <laughs> I, I, I'm like, so cause once again, doing that, you know, there's all this fighting going on, stuff like that. Were you, are you thinking like, oh, I got to start training the you know, cause I know. Oh, yeah. Have, you know, these other so prior to doing this, I already had been trained in Wushu Kung Fu. Oh, wow, okay. So yeah, a lot, a lot of the cast, I think came from, you know, martial arts backgrounds. Or... Well, if you're gonna be a singer and an actress. And a <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, naturally. Well, <laughs> the next thing, yeah. <laughs> so I, yes, I do train in wushu kung fu, and you know, recently I've also taken up some more like MMA boxing. So, yeah, um, lots of martial arts stuff, you know. And I, I, it's different, you know, stunt training. So we originally had a scene in the season one. We had originally had a fight scene that's been cut out. So now nobody gets to see it except oh, for no. us. But. <laughs> Yes, we did that and that was, it was super fun. And even though it didn't make it, I think it was such a wonderful experience because really stunt fighting is is a kind of different from Wushu Kung Fu, if I'm being honest. Like it's, it my, my martial arts background definitely helped me, but I was like, oh, this is really different because I can't actually hit the person. <laughs> I was like, oh. It just wouldn't be a good idea. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. I was like, okay, this is going to be interesting. Cause you, you usually think about like follow through punch, yeah. like go through. And I'm like, I got to stop there before I actually whack somebody. But it was tempting I, to, just to see what happens if you actually did go through with it. Be like, you know, no one's going to, did you actually make contact with anybody? Um, we, <laughs> we had some stuff where we had like padding on our arms. Cause when we, block each other um and i ended up having bruises because i would just block the same spot over and over again as we were practicing our scenes so it was just like hours and hours a day just blocking the same spot so at the end of the day i was like oh i got like a little bruise there but uh, i i think that you know we would probably have to do a lot more stunt training so, going into this. just in case it doesn't get released what was the fight who are you fighting okay yeah, I think this is what I'm going to say. Um, I was fighting with, um, it was a kind of like a practice fighting. Yeah. Uh, we were practicing our fighting skills with um, Azula and Ty Lee. So the three of us were, is kind of showing our training, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. Yeah. And I'm not sure if that choreography will make it into later seasons. It was, it was fun. It was, we did some fun stuff. So when, um, when you think about the character Azula and, and May, now, uh, the relationship is beginning got be, sort of get explored in the first season. Do you think May actually does feel connection with Azula, or is it Azula's position that she's connected to that that May wants to be connected to? I do think that there is, you know, connection, especially when you just spend so much time together with somebody. You know, 
it's a it's a very complicated thing. These are these are young girls in in hard times. And even if they don't always agree on what to do and they don't agree on all their philosophies, I, I think there is a, a real connection there and they, they did grow up together. And you know, there is a special bond that comes with growing up together, even if you do grow apart, even if you go your separate ways, there's always that special bond of memory, of childhood, of, mm -hmm. of history. So um, like I said, the one who plays on Missoula is Elizabeth uh, Yu. Yes. Um, what she like working with? I'm sorry? What, what would she like working with? She is, oh my gosh, Lizzie is the best. She is, she is so talented, such a sweetheart. She is such a hard worker. And I, I really hope people out there can just appreciate just the her amazingness if that's a word but yeah she's she's just she's wonderful and you know she really got into her character's head she did she did her research she she put so much thought and effort and it really showed through and she trained hard for those martial arts scenes because she doesn't come from a martial arts background and she trained hard because she wanted to do justice to azula who she she loves as a character and and I feel really blessed to have been able to work with her because, you know, people like her are rare to come by, you know, really, really passionate, really talented and really genuinely kind. So um, the character of May, once again, is known in, uh, as the gloomy girl. Um, so, so, <laughs> so when you're playing, um, so how did you bring in that nuance to, the, to the, your live action scenes for the um, first season? Yes. So I think that was an interesting Thing, given that I am not so gloomy in real life. I I think that coming into this, especially for my first round audition, they did they did not really emphasize gloomy as a characteristic of her because it was just very bare bones detail. So I kind of just played it how I would play my character and they they liked it and I had a talk with some of the people and they're asking, why were you cast in this? And they're like, well, because beyond the deadpan facade and the obvious gloominess, um, there was another layer of like humor and emotion. And I was like, that's that's interesting. And I, I, I think that I, I keeping that in mind of that's what they liked in my audition. Mm -hmm. I wanted to kind of give that to uh, put that in more into my scenes. And I wanted to, you know, I wanted people to be able to see my my thoughts, if that makes sense, through my gloomy facade. Like, yeah, I don't care, but I still have thoughts on things. Like, mm -hmm. and I, I think that that is the interesting part about playing a deadpan character because you can be just deadpan and show no emotion, and that's not really as engaging most of the time as somebody who's deadpan, but for a reason. You know, when mm -hmm. you know we get to see in the beach episode later on in like I think it's book three, and she gets to explain why she is the way she is, and keeping that in mind, I think I was trying to keep that in mind for all my scenes and moving forward hopefully getting to do more scenes i will definitely get to go more into that so assuming because the, the, the series the live action may not necessarily follow the cartoon where do you want your character to go from here i think in terms of overall character arcs i think we're remaining pretty faithful to the to cartoon <laughs> not having too many changes in terms of that i think they did kind of uh, tie together some storylines but in, over, in terms of overall character arcs, I think we're going to go a pretty similar route to the original cartoon. And in terms of storyline wise, what I want to do, I would love to do more fight scenes with the gang. Like I, me and uh, Ty Lee and, and Azula, I think we could have some really fun uh, scenes with the gang. And I think that if they could really expand upon, you know, our, the chase that we have, I think that would be really fun to watch as well as to, to do. So other than Avatar season two, which is obviously gonna happen, we put it out there already. What is next for you? Um, in terms of my career or, yeah. yeah. Honestly, since, so we had the SAG AFTRA strike last year and I had been taking the time to write music as we were talking about earlier. And so I've really been working on a lot of music and i don't know i don't know when i'm going to be putting out stuff but i definitely do intend on releasing music someday really so oh you're gonna, you're gonna have an album come out i don't 
I don't know when because I've I've been writing quite a bit of songs and I I do have an intention of releasing music someday. I'm not sure where that will fall along my career timeline and that's something you know to discuss with you know my my family and maybe like my manager and stuff like that and just kind of figure out where that fits in my career but i definitely would love to share some of my music because it's something that i am passionate about and it's something that i love doing well whatever you do next come back on the show to talk about it right you've been terrific thank you <laughs> thank so much. you have a fantastic night you too thank you thank you for listening to another episode of the Versa stars podcast Please help me battle the algorithms by liking and subscribing. Be sure to return for the next episode when David Mack boards the mothership, discusses his new novel, Star Trek Firewall. Into next voyage, travel on.